Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's International Dermatology Education Foundation Educational Series webinar. My name is Ashley with RBC Consultants, and the topic of tonight's uh, webinar is what we know about this oral medication in moderate to severe plaque psoriasis and its four-year data. As moderator this evening, we have Dr. Ali Shabazz, Clinical Assistant Professor, Texas A&M School of Medicine, Dermatologist, Westlake Dermatology, Westlake Dermatology and Cosmetic Surgery. As speaker this evening, we have Dr. Dawn Merritt, Program Director of the Ohio Health Dermatology Residency Program. We would like to thank our supporter, Bristol Myers Squibb, for making this educational event possible. A couple of logistic tips before we begin. If you're having trouble hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using the telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues, please submit your questions in the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser and will be emailed to you within one to two days. We would greatly appreciate it if you could fill in this short survey. Also within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. For at the end of the webinar this evening, we will have a Q&A portion. If you have any questions, we welcome you to submit them in the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, without further ado, I would like to pass the floor virtually to Dr. Ali Shabazz. Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Ashley, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Ali Shabazz. I'm a dermatologist here in Austin, Texas, and a clinical assistant professor at Texas A&M School of Medicine, and a dermatologist here at Westlake Dermatology. Thank you uh, to Dr. Leon Kursik, who is the president of the International Dermatology Educational Foundation, uh, for inviting me to moderate this uh, wonderful webinar. The IDEF is a nonprofit organization whose principal mission is to raise awareness and improve dermatologic care for all around the world through education, especially in underserviced areas. As you can see, we've had a slew of very esteemed guests uh, in our past educational sessions as these webinars attract some of the most world experts in topics such as alopecia areata, acne, psoriasis, and hydronitis superativa. If you'd like to stay up to date with our educational series webinars, please follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook at the following handles. As well, you can always register on idfeducationalseries.com for upcoming educational events. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Don Merritt um, to discuss what we know about this oral medication in moderate to severe plaque psoriasis and its four-year data. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. Thanks, Dr. Shabazz. I appreciate the intro. So I'm excited tonight to talk to you all about this oral medication. Um, and as we get started, I think most of you have probably figured out we're talking about SOTIC2 today. And so with that, we'll kind of jump in and we'll get started. So tonight, we're, like I said, we're talking about SOTIC2 or Dacrovacitinib, um, which is an oral therapy. So we're going to talk about that idea that oral therapy is now redefined for our treatment of our patients with moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. So as always, I have to let you know that tonight is a promotional speaker program and it's being sponsored by Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, I am not an employee, but I am being paid on behalf of BMS. And so while I'm happy to do this and hopefully you all walk away learning some interesting new facts about uh, SOTIC2. This is not accredited for CME, so we don't get CME tonight. And here are my disclosures that are shared below. And with that, let's jump in. So I think it's really important as we jump in and we start to talk about SOTIC2, Dacrovacitinib, this molecule, that we talk about the mechanism of TIC2. And so, you know, over the last several years, we've all started learning about this JAK-STAT pathway. And TIC2 is one of those molecules. And so when we think about it, one of the things that I think often, you know, we've all been hearing about IL-23 and IL-17, and we know about that, but I don't think we all understand necessarily where this JAK-STAT pathway sits, and it really is this link that binds IL-23 to IL-17 in this sort of axis, we can call it. And so it's this intracellular mediator. 
And when we look at this, so tick two sits there with jack two, and it is really that piece on the TH17 cell that connects IL-23 when it binds to its receptor to the production ultimately of IL-17 from that TH17 cell. So if so tick 2 comes in and can block that tick 2 molecule, then we can ultimately shut down that inflammatory pathway. And so it's this intracellular mechanism that we can use to really impact this whole, this whole access that we're seeing. And so I think the other thing that's really important is that we talk about all four of these, what we call jacks, or that have become, you know, jack inhibitors. And so we have tick 2 JAK1, JAK2, and JAK3. So they're all considered Janus kinases. And so while they all belong to the same kinase family, they're absolutely structurally different from one another. So I like to liken this to like, I have a sibling. We both had the same last name growing up. Well, all of these Janus kinases have the same piece. They all have this active ATB binding site that makes them part of the same family. But my first name is definitely different than my sibling and anybody who knows us would know that we're totally, absolutely different people. Um, couldn't be more you know, different in my family. But that is sort of what we see here. We have these regulatory domains and that's what makes them different and conveys different properties to each of these Janus kinases. So when we look at that, what we can see is they each of these different um, Janus kinases actually have different impacts. So even the cytokines they impact is different. So when you think about the cytokines, what we see with TIX2 is the things we'd expect. IL-23, because that's the main active place that we want to interact with when we're thinking of psoriasis, IL-12, and type 1 interferon. And that's it. There's nothing else. When we think about JAK1, 2, and 3, there's a lot of other cytokines, which makes them really interesting as targets for other disease states um, as well. But we also see some of these other systems that are impacted, like blood cell development, immune system in general, metabolic and lipids. And so I think as you start to see those differences, it starts to play out in what we see and not only how they work, but also some of the other things that we find can be related. So one of the things I think is important, because I'm often asked, well, how do we know, right? You know, what do we know about this as far as the selectivity? Well, here we can actually look at some of these different drugs that target different jacks, right? So we have like topocitinib or upadacitinib or baricitinib. And what we're finding is those, they're really designed to target JAK1, JAK3, and JAK2 to a lesser extent. Well, so TIC2 wasn't designed that way. It was designed to really selectively target TIC2. And that's what we see. We get 50% daily inhibition of TIC2. When we look across the board, these other drugs really are not having any significant inhibition of TIC2. But then when we look at JAK1 and 3, where we're getting really great inhibition of that, which may or may not be your goal with these other drugs, what we're seeing here with so TIC2, we really don't see that inhibition. So I think we can really see that varying degree of inhibition of those different Janus kinases. So one of the questions I get when I talk to, whether it be my residents or my colleagues or I'm out in the community is, how do you sort of identify which patients are candidates for systemic therapy in general? And I think we all do this a bit differently. But I think at the end of the day, we've sort of moved to a place where um, for most of our patients who have truly moderate to severe disease, I think most of us these days are really reaching for a systemic alternative. And I think our patients are demanding that. So here we're looking at this patient. And so, of course, he's a hypothetical patient. So this is Seth. He's 43. And he comes into the office and he said, creams haven't been doing what I had hoped for. And I'm looking for an option that I don't have to put on. And I hear that often. Patients who've been doing creams, um, they really hit a sort of a burnout mode where they're like, 
I just want something that's easy. It's hard to remember. It's messy. It's time consuming. They want something else. So this patient, he has moderate plaque psoriasis. It's on his elbows, his hands, his knees. He's complaining of the flaking and dryness. Of course, you know, patients, the aesthetics of it, not to mention, you know, some of the other sensations they get, the itching and the irritation. And when we look at him, he's had disease for over two years and he's been on topical steroids or some other therapy for at least the past nine months. And so he really, with his BSA, POSI score and PGA falls into that moderate to severe category. So here's a perfect patient who even comes in saying, I just want something systemic. I want to make this simple. So from my standpoint, these are really sort of the reasons why when I reach for SOTIC2 that I think about. I think one of the big things is it's a once a day dose. Um, I think we've all found our patients realistically, it's hard for people to remember to take stuff twice a day, especially if they don't typically take a medication every single day. I know I'm personally pretty terrible at it when you know I get an antibiotic or something that I've not been on before. It's hard to remember. So I think having a once a day dose is really important. I think what we're gonna look at here as we go is we really have superior efficacy and we can show up to two times that efficacy versus the other oral available apremolast. And then we have now safety profile data through four years of clinical trials. And we'll walk through that to kind of walk through that safety. So when we think about this trial, I think it's important to realize that the trial, the phase three trials were designed um, to have this head-to-head -head versus both placebo and a premolast. And I think that's helpful. And so when we look at that, what you see is POETIC 1 and 2 were, of course, the two pivotal trials. And POETIC 1, a premolast doing 30 milligrams VID, was absolutely head-to-head -head with placebo and SOTIC 2 in a 1 to 2 to 1 randomization over that first 16 weeks. And then after that, patients could transition. And so what we see is we get to sort of get that data and you're gonna see that as we move through where we can see some of that head-to-head -head, um, you know, contrast. And then in POETIC 2, again, there, were a little, there was a little bit more differentiation after that 24-week endpoint, but ultimately I think we're gonna be able to go in and look at that and you'll really appreciate being able to see that data along with the Premolas. You know, it's a drug that we've all probably had some experience with. We already have sort of a picture in our heads of what this is gonna look like in our patients. So then when I show you data compared to that, I think it makes it really easy for you to have an idea of what that would look like in your own patient base. I do think it's helpful. Oh, I guess, the, I'm sorry guys, I'm gonna back up. The links are not gonna work tonight. So, thank you for getting me back to where I needed to be. <laughs> well, that answer, I apologize to everyone. I thought we were gonna be good to go through our link. So my, my apologies, and I, I apologize. I don't think we are where we need to be now. Okay, well, we will avoid links in the future. So um, when we look at our data, what we're looking here is this, um, the original data coming out of POETIC 1, and what we're looking at is just SOTIC 2 to placebo. And what we're looking for is a POSI 75 response at week 16. And I think what you're seeing here, we had you know 58% in POETIC 1, 54%. Um, when we looked at for a SPGA of 01 for those patients who were either clear or nearly clear, so a slightly different endpoint, but ultimately very similar. And so we're seeing really robust differences, obviously, with placebo. So what if we look at it to a premolast? And I think this is really helpful. So this is what we sort of talked about a moment ago. So here's what we see with a premolast. You know, at week 16, 35% of patients achieving a POSI 75. At week 24, we see 38. Well, with SOTIC2, 
58% of patients achieved that same POSI 75 at week 16, 69% at week 24. So not quite, but nearly double the patients um, achieving that, that really, you know, that superior uh, POSI 75 at week 24 than a premolast. So what about a POSI 90? Um, I think in this day and age, you and I all, this is what we're looking for. We're looking for a POSI 90 response in our patients. So we can look at that against a premolast as well. So we see a really nice separation, only 20% of a premolast patients, 36% of the SOTIC2 patients, 22% at week 24 versus 42% of the SOTIC2 patients at week 24 achieving a POSI 90 response. So about two times the patients, again, achieving that POSI 90 over a premolast. And so from my standpoint, you know, as we have options in our, you know, in our tool belt these days, when I think about efficacy and a patient comes in, the reality is we all know they're looking for this. This is what they want. They want to know that when they come back to see us in three or four months, that they're going to see significant differences. And this is something that helps me choose which medication I'm gonna go to. So here are some patient photos that we can look at. And so these were submitted um, as real patient photos. They didn't necessarily come out of the clinical trial, hence why the patient's leg is up on an ottoman at home. I love these. And so what we see is at week 16, already a pretty significant change in their baseline. By week 24, we're really just seeing a little bit of erythema. And at week 52, they're looking really clear. And so I think this is, you know, I love patients that do this because ultimately it's usually a patient who's super excited um, about the outcomes. So here we're looking at sort of the fact that we now have four-year data. And where did that come from? Well, we have that initial POETIC 1 and 2, which were the parent trials, those phase three clinical trials that, that we just looked at. And those were through 52 weeks or one year. But then we have the long-term extension that actually takes us out to five years now. So we have that additional data. And what we're gonna look at tonight is the four-year safety data. And so I think that's really helpful to have long-term data because we all wanna know what does this look like? So our patients do well, and they all wanna say, well, what happens if I stay on drug? Well, we now have data to look at that. And so what we see is we find a really nice, continuous, durable response for those patients achieving these POSI responses. So 72% of the patients we talked about at week 52 achieving a POSI 75. And when we look at that out to week 208, we see that it looks very much the same. Um, with a POSI 90, we're seeing almost 50% of patients at week 52 achieving a POSI 90. And again, very much the same as patients remain on drug. So again, really nice durable um, response rates that we can see for our patients. So I think the other question becomes, what about our patients who have um, disease in more hard to treat areas? Well, Sadie here is a perfect example. And so this example is a patient, she's 34. She comes in and she's complaining mostly of disease a lot in her scalp, but also on her knees and her lower legs. And in her case, she's been using shampoos and topicals for three years off and on. And I think we see that a lot in our patients who have chronic disease. They end up using the topicals sort of off and on because it's not simple and easy for them to do. She does have a past medical history of high cholesterol and some family history of diabetes. And so this is another patient, I think is a great example of someone where she wants something simple. She wants something that fits with her lifestyle and potentially she really obviously wants something that's gonna give her better efficacy. And so we have data now looking at her scalp response or scalp response in general. And so here we can look at the scalp response for SOTIC2 in comparison to a premolas. And so what we find is 70% of patients are able to achieve a, a PGA of zero or one in the scalp. So they're getting clear, almost clear. 
where when we look at the patients on a Premalast, we're only seeing 39%. And this is at week 16. So in that first four months of therapy, 70% of, of the patients on SOTIC2 are really getting to that place where they're clear, almost clear, and that's what I think they are all looking for ultimately in their therapy. So what about palmar plantar, another particularly difficult area for us often to treat when we think about palms and soles? So again, we're looking at the percentage of patients who were able to achieve either a clear or almost clear palms and soles, so that PGA of 0 1 at week 16. I think it, here it's important to notice that we're looking at compared to placebo, not to a premolast in this situation. But what we're seeing is 56% of the patients and 0% of the placebo patients and POETIC 1. We have a slightly different um, spread, but again, I think what we're seeing is 46% of the patients in POETIC 2 and 24% of the placebo patients. And sometimes I think we see that these different trial arms have slightly different data. But I think ultimately what we're seeing is a really high percentage, about 50% of patients or more, are able to achieve that at week 16. Now, photos, of course, always super helpful for us. And here we see a baseline. By week two, that patient already was seeing significant changes in their palms and as far as the amount of scaling and erythema that we're seeing. By week 24, there's really not a whole lot to see. And at week 52, their palms look much like mine and yours. And so again, patients submitted photos, but I think they really speak to sort of the outcomes patients are seeing. Now let's talk about safety because at the end of the day, I think you and I both, we want something that's efficacious. We want something that is safe and we need both things. So here, what we're gonna talk about is we can look at those adverse reactions that occurred in 1% or more of the patients and we're higher than placebo. And so what we see is upper respiratory tract infections, blood CPK, all pretty similar to placebo. There is a slight difference when we look at herpes simplex, mouth ulcers, folliculitis, and acne. What I can tell you across the board is um, when we look at those things, ultimately, the vast majority of these patients actually continued on therapy, and in most cases were easily treated by uh, the PI in the studies. And so from my standpoint, I'm a dermatologist. I can deal with folliculitis, acne, mouth ulcers, those are things that I understand. Um, those are adverse reactions, at least from my standpoint, while I think they're exceptionally low, if I have a patient with them, I am comfortable managing. Now, when we compare the adverse reactions, in these cases, we're looking at those that happened in greater than 5% or more of the patients. We're looking at SOTIC2, versus a premolas versus placebo here. And this is in that first 16 weeks of the trials. And what we're seeing is ultimately, they're, you know, for nasopharyngitis, very similar across all three arms. But when we start to separate out for headache, diarrhea, nausea, as we all know, if you're familiar with the premolas, we see those adverse events actually go up significantly in the premolas arm. And that's probably as most of us would have expected. I think the other key important piece here is when we talk about adverse events, what percentage of patients that were in the trial felt that those, you know, those were necessary, they and the PI felt that it was necessary for them to actually discontinue. And what we see is actually SOTIC2 had the lowest discontinuation rate due to any adverse event during that first 16 weeks. It was actually less than half of what we saw in a premolas and still less than what we saw in the placebo arm. So when we look out over 52 weeks, so now what happens if we leave our patients on drug, and they're on drug for that entire year. Well, what we see there is very similar. We don't see any significant increases. Um, we don't see, you know, we're not seeing, so TIC2 actually supersede what we saw in a premolast. It's exactly opposite exactly what we anticipated. Much higher adverse events for headache, diarrhea, nausea in the premolast arm, and so TIC2 looked very, very similar to placebo.
So what about if we come out and we look at adverse events of interest? And why are these of interest? Well, these are the things like herpes, and I get questioned about that. But these are the other things that I think we think about when we think about Janus kinases. And so MACE events, VTEs, ATEs, malignancy, serious infection. And I think what you see is you get to look at this and you compare the placebo, SOTIC2, and apremilast is that we're really not seeing any significant differences here. Across the board, um, you know, I think what we're seeing is that these are all very low levels for all of these, for placebo, SOTIC2, or apremilast, but we're not seeing a case where SOTIC2 was actually um, more significant with the slight exception of herpes zoster, where there was a, you know, just a numerically a slight difference. So now we have this four-year data. And so through four years, we can look at that safety profile from the clinical trials. And so when we look at this, you know, one of the things I always want to know is as patients are exposed to drug longer, do we see any new onset signals? And we're not. We're not seeing any of those. The other thing I think that's important is um, when we look at adverse events, they actually start to decrease over time. Um, serious to AEs stay very similar throughout all the years. And when we look at adverse events leading to discontinuation, they also start to drop off. When we look at the deaths, I, you know, I often say, oh, there were deaths in the clinical trial. I think it's important, first of all, to talk about what those were. So two of the deaths in the SOTIC arm through one year, um, and there were an additional nine deaths that were reported in the long-term extension. But what else was happening during the course of this study? Well, it was COVID. This was during the COVID pandemic. And so seven of the deaths were attributed to COVID-19. Um, and then when we look at sort of, we compared that incidence of COVID-19 related deaths um, to those in the placebo group, very similar. Um, there was also a patient who had a ruptured aortic aneurysm and another one who was a sudden death. So I think the take home is we're not seeing any new safety signals here for any of these um, areas. Now, what about those AEs of interest? Um, the ones that we sort of looked at a moment ago. And so here we're looking at things like base events, VTEs, total malignancies. And again, we're not seeing any new safety signals over time. We're not seeing any of those actually increase with additional exposure. And some of the other AEs that we talk about, like acne, folliculitis, mouth ulcers, we actually watch those fall off as patients remain on drug throughout the extended time period. So, you know, when we think about using SOTIC2, I think it's important to talk about the indication. And we already said moderate to severe plaque psoriasis patients who are adults, and they in theory have to be candidates for systemic therapy or phototherapy. Um, and I think we see these patients every day in our practice. And we've already sort of talked about a lot of these safety information. Um, you know, I think all of our drugs that are impacting the immune system we have to think about the potential risk for infections, but we've looked at that data and you've gotten to see that the, the serious adverse events, um, looking at that for infections, those, those numbers are actually quite low. And when we look at um, think and talk about immunizations, I think it's important that we remember that just like all of our other systemic medications, in a perfect world, you're gonna try and complete all age-appropriate immunizations um, prior to starting if possible. But if not, I mean, I think the take home is trying to avoid our live vaccines. So there also is in the package insert, this, this piece in here about potential risks related to JAK inhibition. But keep in mind as you read that, that's really speaking to TIC2 um, inhibition and that while it is a Janus kinase, um, but they're giving you the data that actually comes from JAK inhibition that came out of a rheumatoid arthritis study that was not with a TIC2 drug. And so it is a little different and I think you have to sort of process that on your own, how you want to, you know, think about that. Um, but we talked about specific populations that you probably don't want to use SOTIC2 and would be your pregnancy patients.
your patients who are lactating. And then the one area I think that we haven't really touched on that we should is that SOTIC2 is not recommended in patients who have severe hepatic impairment. But that is probably the one area um, where you would probably definitely, other than your pregnant patients, where I want to consider not utilizing it. So reasons to use it. Simple once daily dosing, superior efficacy up to two times the efficacy versus a premolast, and that safety profile that we looked at that gives us safety data through four years in clinical trials. And I think for all of us, having that safety data that really looks from my perspective, looked really good. And, and I can look at that in comparison to a drug that I've already been using in my practice. That gives me some of the confidence um, to continue using this regularly in my psoriasis patients. So a couple other things that maybe you don't think about. So we talked about once daily dosing, um, but the other thing that's important is there's no dose titration or dose adjustments. And I think for me, this is helpful. It saves for a lot of patients who don't always quite understand what to do when you have to do dose titrations. So they start taking their six milligrams a day on day one, and that's what they take throughout the entire course of therapy. We know that there's no known drug-to-drug -drug interactions so that makes that really clean and easy for us to use. We do recommend you avoid use with live vaccines, but you know, as far as medications the patient is already on, there aren't any known. Patients sometimes ask about, you know, if I'm having a reaction, what happens? Well, we have a half-life that is 10 hours. So that gives you some idea, but you had a patient who, for some reason, needed to stop drug for some reaction, that you have a short half-life and you have an idea of what that's going to look like as it comes out of their system. It can, the drug can be taken with or without food. So for patients, it's easy. I always tell patients, you know, in a perfect world, I recommend patients take medication in the morning. That way, if they forget, they can take it later in the day. It's hard if you're taking it at bedtime and then you wake up the next day. To them, it's the next day. They're not going to take it then. They just end up missing it. So I often say, you know, take it in the morning. And if you forget it and later you're just going to take it with a swig of water, that's okay. The only lab values you have to obtain prior to starting is there's a recommendation for doing TB evaluation before initiation. If you have a patient where you suspect liver disease, then you want to do baseline LFTs. But outside of that, with that, ex you know, outside of that exception, realistically, the only lab testing you need to consider doing is that baseline TB. And then it is recommended in the package start that you periodically evaluate triglycerides in your patients. And you can use your own clinical guidelines to decide how often that is and how often you want to check those in your patients. But overall, I think when we think about starting it and using it in the office, it's a really simple drug. And I love that. I want something that is that easy button that makes it easy. I can get a patient started on drug, and then it's easy to keep them on drug as far as you know, use and compliance with once day do daily dosing. So again, just a reminder, the really the only thing you need to do in the beginning is evaluate for TB, unless they have that suspected liver disease, and then you can initiate therapy. Um, you know, we have samples in my office, so it makes it really simple. Patients who come in and are, you know, upset about their psoriasis and frustrated, I can send them home that day and they can take their first pill right there in the office if they want. And the take home is, they can get started right away. We can go ahead and get them, you know, put through the approval process and they can easily stay on drug. So I think, again, this is the other piece, right? We always can decide we want to utilize it, feel good about safety, but then we have to be able to get it into our patients' hands. And BMS has done a really nice job of getting this program together. So they offer a free 30-day supply for all eligible patients. They can get that one-time 30-day trial. In addition, they have a bridge program that's up to three years. So this has been really helpful for me. If I have an insurance company that just denies it out of the blue, you know, right off the bat, I can go ahead and get them on bridge. And then my staff can work on, you know, whether it's using photos or other letters over time to try and get that approved. 
But that bridge program means that when I talk to a patient and I say, this is what I want you to use, that almost always, even if I have to go through bridge, I know my patient is gonna get on drug. I don't have to talk about it and then wait and find out that maybe they're not gonna be approved because if they're not, that denial rolls into the bridge. And they have a copay assistance program for your patients who do get initial approval through insurance. And when that happens with the copay assistance program, patients can pay as little as $0 a month. And I think for a lot of patients, that's super important. If you want more information, you can actually scan the QR code, and that has some more information related to the patient uh, support programs that BMS offers. So I think that sort of brings us back to the patients we started with, with Seth and Sadie. And I think in both cases, you know, one of the questions is what other data or product attributes might be of interest to them? Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's the things we just talked about, right? It's, it's something simple they can do. It's a pill they can take once a day. They don't have to utilize a cream. Right then and there, we, especially if we already have a TB you know, evaluation on file, for a lot of my patients, I already do, but if I don't, I can get that right away and they can get started you know, almost immediately once that TB evaluation is done. And so for them, it's something simple and easy and they can get started and see the efficacy results that we just talked about tonight. So I think one of the big things our patients want when we talk about those efficacy results is they wanna know about mean posi improvement. And I think we've all started talking this way because when we talk to our patients, how do we do that? You know, you and I talk about PGA and posi scores, that doesn't mean anything. They wanna know what's the average outcome that I can expect. And so we can tell Seth and Sadie, you know, the average patient by week four already saw 42% improvement. By week 16, the average patient, that mean percent improvement was 72%. And by week 24, 77%. So that's the kind of data that our patients like to hear. And I think that's the sort of thing that can really help drive that home. That gives us some other photos that we can look at. And so here is a patient who submitted some photos um, through their physician, and we have sort of baseline. Week two, we're already seeing changes. And by week 24, the patient is clear. And again, at week 52, still looking very good. Here we have a right lower leg, baseline, week two, week 24, and by week 52, again, looking really clear. Here's a left elbow at baseline, really pretty erythematous, very scaly. Um, and by week 24, there's very little to be seen. Here's an, a patient, their right knee. We can look through that. And we have their baseline in week 24. And then we're going to see the same patient by looking at their bilateral knees. And again, baseline week 24. So we got to kind of see different body areas here. And I think for our patients, this is sort of that data we just talked about. So for our patients, we've already sort of touched on this. Once da daily dosing, superior efficacy to a premolast, up to two times the efficacy that we typically see with a premolast, and then safety that we can see through four years in clinical trials. So with that, I say thank you to you. I apologize for a little technical difficulties in the beginning um, with the slides. If you would like more information, please, by all means, scan that, and that'll actually take you to the website, and you can get some more information. And then there is the, the little uh, QR code for uh, a survey, if you'd like to do that. Thank you, Dr. Merritt. That was amazing and very well, well said and informative. Uh, now we're going to move on to some Q&As. Um, the questions that have been asked um, in the question pane on the right-hand side. The first one is um, to Dr. Merritt. Why was the PASI 75 response selected as the co-primary endpoint for the POETIC uh, 1 and POETIC 2 trials rather than the PASI 90 or 100 response? Sure, and I think in this day and age, you know, a lot of people might say, well, why did BMS choose that? But 
That was necessary because a premolast in their clinical trials, in their phase three trials that they did, they ultimately used POSI 75 as the primary endpoint. So that was necessary to have that as one of the co-primary endpoints. Great. Um, now, are there any data assessing the efficacy of SOTIC2 in those hard to treat areas with like scalp, palmar plantar, or fingernail involvement beyond week 16? So there is, um, there has been some data that has been, you know, actually published out there that was actually presented um, last year. I can't necessarily go over all that today, but if anyone would like more of that data, please, by all means, reach out to your MSL or to the scientific team at BMS, and they would be happy to go through that with you. That's a great point. I think our MSLs are a great resource for a lot of the data that um, SOTIC2 has. Um, a great, another great question that has just been asked right now, can SOTIC2 be taken with or without food? Um, so I think we touched on that. It can be either. So either way, kind of nice. You can take it with water. You can take it with a full meal. There is no data that the absorption is impacted one way or the other. So it makes it really simple. Fantastic. And this is a question that I love asking as well. Um, are there any specific testing requirements before initiating patients with SOTIC2? So just sort of driving home, the only test that you actually have to do, unless you suspect um, some sort of hepatic disease, the only test you have to do is TB evaluation. And so you can choose how you want to do that in your own practice. But other than that, you don't need to do anything. If you have a patient where you suspect some form of liver disease, then you're gonna to wanna to do a baseline LFT, but that's it. Fantastic. Um, and we're just moving on to the next slide to see if there's any more questions. No, I think we answered all of them. Uh, again, to anyone attending, if you have any questions, feel free, feel free to email us after and we're happy to answer those questions after the fact. Um, and then I would just like to, if you don't mind moving the slides, Dr. Merritt. Yeah. And next. <clears throat> So thank you again, Bristol Myers Squibb, for uh, sponsoring uh, this wonderful webinar series. And with that, we will conclude uh, this webinar series. And I'd like to just introduce the following uh, webinar on the next slide. So next week, we'll be having Dr. Lisa Swanson from St. Luke's Ch Children's Hospital uh, to discuss um, Eviglis or Levicrizumab, a new treatment option. And that's going to be on Tuesday, October 8th, uh, on uh, 2024 at 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a wonderful evening.